Siddharma Pundarika, or The Lotus of the True Law, translated by H. Kern from Max Muller's Sacred Books of the East, Volume 21. Introduction. The Siddharma Pundarika is one of the nine dharmas which are known by the titles of One, Ashtasa, Hasrika, Pragna, Paramita, Two, Ganda, Vyuha, Three, Dasa, Bhumisvara, Four, Samadhi Raga, five Lanka Vatara, six Sedarma Pundarika, seven Tathagata Kuyaka, eight Lalita Vistara, nine Suvarna Prabhasa. These nine works to which divine worship is offered embrace, to use the words of the first investigator of Nepalese Buddhism, in the first, an abstract of the philosophy of Buddhism, in the seventh, a treatise on the esoteric doctrines, and in the seven remaining ones, a full illustration of every point of the ordinary doctrine and discipline taught in the easy and effective way of example and anecdote, interspersed with occasional instances of dogmatic instruction. With the exception of the first, these works are therefore of a narrative kind, but interwoven with much occasional speculative matter. As to the form, it would seem that all the dharmas may rank as narrative works, which, however, does not exclude in some of them a total difference in style of composition and character. The Lalita Vistara, e.g., has the movement of a real epic the Siddharma Pundarika has not. The latter bears the character of a dramatic performance in undeveloped mystery play in which the chief interlocutor, not the only one, is Shakyamuni, the Lord. It consists of a series of dialogues brightened by the magic effects of a would-be supernatural scenery. The phantasmagorical parts of the whole are as clearly intended to impress us with the idea of the might and glory of the Buddha, as his speeches are, to set forth his all-surpassing wisdom. Some affinity of its technical arrangement with that of the regular Indian drama is visible in the prologue or Nadana, where Manguzri at the end prepares the spectators and auditors both are the same for the beginning of the grand drama by telling them that the Lord is about to awake from his mystic slumber and to display his infinite wisdom and power. In the book itself, we find it termed a sutra or sutranta of the class called Mahavipulya. In a highly instructive discussion on the peculiar characteristics and comparative age of the different kinds of sutras, Bernouf arrives at the conclusion that the Mahavipulya sutras are posterior to the simple sutras in general. <clears throat> As there are two categories of simple sutras, one, those in which the events narrated are placed contemporary with the Buddha. Two, those which refer to persons living a considerable time after his reputed period, for example, Ashoka. It follows that the composition of the Mahavipulya sutras must be held to fall in a later time than the production of even the second category of simple sutras. Now, in one of the latter, the Ashoka Avadana, we read of Ashoka using the word Dinara, which leads us to the conclusion that the said Avadana was composed not only after the introduction of Dinara from the West in the first century of our era or later, but at a still more modern time when people had forgotten the foreign origin of the coin in question. The results arrived at by Bernouf may be right so far as any Mahavipulya Sutra as a whole is concerned, they cannot be applied to all the component parts of such a work. Not to go further than the Siddharma Pundarika and the Lalita Vistara, it can hardly be questioned that these works contain parts of very different dates and derived from various sources. The material discrepancies between the version in prose and that in verse are occasionally too great to allow us to suppose them to have been made simultaneously or even by different authors conjointly at work. Further, it can be shown 
that the Mahavipulya Sutras are partially made up of such materials as must be referred to the oldest period of Buddhism. Let me adduce some examples to render more clear what I mean. <clears throat> if we compare Lalita Vistara, Calc Ed, Editor, page 513, 13, page 514, 2, with Mahavaga, edited Dr. Oldenburg, 1, 5, 2, we received that the passages are to a great extent literally identical and that the variations amount to little more than a varietis lectionis. The passage adduced is in prose. Now let us take some stanzas. In Mahavaga, I, 5, 3, the Lord utters the following shlokas. Kikena me anhigatam halam dani pagasitam raga dosa para tehi nayam damo susam budo patisotagami nipunam gambiram dudasam anum ragarata na dakanti tamo kandena avuta this does not materially differ from lalita vistara page 515-16 sequence pratis rotagamiko margo Gambiro, Duriso Mama, Natam, Drakshinit, Raganda, Alam, Tazmat, Prakasitum, Anusrotam, Pravianti, Kamishu, Patita, Praga, Krikrina, Miyam, Sempreptam, Alam, Tazmat, Prakasitum. Though there is some difference in the wording and arrangement of the verses, it is of such a kind as to exclude all idea of the compiler of the Lalita Vistar having composed the distichs himself. Even the words Ayam, Damo, Susambudo, and Nipunam of the Pali text were known to him as appears from the passage in prose immediately preceding the slokas quoted, Gambira, Kalvayam, Mahabrahman, Maya, Dharmo, Bisam Buddha Sushmo Nipuna what follows Api Kame Brahman Imegati Abhikshanam Pratibhasata is but a slight not very felicitous modification of what we read in the Mahavaga one C Apisu Bhagavantam Ima Anakariya Gathayo Hati Bamsu Pube Asa Tu Puba Evidently from the same source are the verses in Trishtub uttered by the god Brahma, Mahavaga I-5-7, and those found in Lalita Vistara, page 517-3, Sikh. The former text has Paturahosi Magadesu Puri, Damo Asudo Samalehi Kintito Apapur Etam Amatasa Devaram, Sunantu Damam Vimalen and Abudam. The other runs thus Vado Babuva Samaler Vikintito Dharmo Hai Asudo Magadesu Purvam Amritam Muni Tad Vivrinishva Dvaram Srinivanti Dharma Vipulam Vimalena Budam. On comparing the two texts, we may infer that the Pali version is pure, that Vado Babuva is a corruption of Padu Babuva or something like it. Answering to a Sanskrit Pradur Babuva, we cannot deny that the stanzas have the same origin. In Mahavaga I 512, the Lord addresses the god Brahma with the following Tristub. Aparuta Tisam Amatasa Devara Ye Sotavanto Pamunkantu Sadham Vihimasani Pagunam Nabasi Damam Panitam Manugesu Brahma Iti. Then in prose, Atha ko Brahma Sahampati Katavakaso ko mi 
Bhagavata Dhamma Desanayati Bhagavantam Abhivaditva Padakinam Katvatath Ev Antardai. The parallel passage in Lalita Vistar on page 520, 19 sequence has Amhavritas Tesham Amritasya Devara Brahman Iti Satatam Ye Shrota Vanta Pravisanti Shraddha Na Vihethas Angyana Srinivanti Dharmam Magadesu Sattva Atta Kalu Siki Mahabrahma Tantha Gatas Ya Divasanam Viditva Tushta Uragra Atamana Pramudita Kritisama Nasya Gatas Tata Gatasya Padau Sirasabivan Titva Tatre Vantaridat at the meeting of the Agrivaka monk Upaka and the Buddha, the latter is represented as having pronounced the following slokas Mahavaga I six eight and nine Name Akriyo Ati sadiso me na vigrati sad e vakasmim lokasmim in ati me pati pugalo aham hi araha lok aham sata anutaro ekomi samasambudo sitibuto shmi nibuto madisha ve gina honti yi pata azavakayam Gita me Papaka Dhamma Tasmaham Upaka Gino. Materially the same slokas, albeit in somewhat different arrangement, occur Lalita Vistara, page five twenty six twenty two sequence, as being spoken at the same meeting. Akaryo Nahi me Kaskit Sadriso me na Vidyati Ikoham Asmi Sambutaha Sitibudo Nirazrava Aham Yivaham Lok Sashta Hai Aham Anatura Sadevasurgandarvi Nasti Me Prati Pudagala Gina Hi Madvisa Ginia Gi Prapta Azravak Shayam Gita Me Pampaka Dharmas Tanopaka Gino Hai Aham the following verses taken from Mahavaga and Lalita Vistara 1c have likewise the same origin, notwithstanding some variations. Dhamma Kakam, Pavatetam, Gakmi, Kasinam Hiram, Enabutasmi, Lokasmim, Ahani, Amatur, Dudurabim. Compare. Veranasim, Gamishyami, Gatva Vai. Kasikam Hiram Anidubatusya Lukasya Kartasmi Oswadism Prabham Veranasm Gamishyami Gatfagavai Gasikam Hiram Sabdahinaisya Lukasya Tadayashi Mritadadubu Veranasim Gamishyami Gafigai Kasikam Hiram Damakakram Pravataryashi Yokosiv an important passage on the divine side of the Buddha in the Lita Vistara, page 439, secular sequence, almost literally occurs in the Samana Fala Sutta, as has been pointed out by Bernouf. These few examples I have chosen will suffice to prove that the material of a Mahavaya Pudya Sutra is partly as old as that of any other sacred book of the Buddhists. The language of the prose part of those sutras does not differ from that used in the simple sutras of the northern canon. Should the Sanskrit text prove to be younger than the Pali text, then we may say that we do not possess the northern tradition in its original shape. That result, however, affords no criterion for the distinction between the simple sutras and the Mahavipulya sutras, for both are written in the very same Sanskrit if we accept the Gathas. It would lead me too far. Were I to enter into the heart of the question which of the three idioms, Sanskrit, Pali, and the so-called Gatha dialect, 
was the oldest scriptural language of the Buddhists, and I will therefore confine myself to a few remarks. In the first place, it will be granted that the same person cannot have uttered any speech or stands in two languages at the same time, and further that he is not likely to have spoken Sanskrit when expressing himself in prose, and to have had recourse to a mere dialect when speaking in poetry. One need not suppose that the common and everyday language of the god Brahma and the Buddha was Pali or Prakrit. Prakrit. In order to call it an absurdity that those persons would have spoken prose and Sanskrit and poetry in the Gatha dialect, such as we find in some passages already quoted and in many others. Nor is it absurd, even if we do not believe that Pali is the original language of scripture, to contend that the Sanskrit text of the canonical works is at any rate a translation from some dialect. If the Sanskrit text of the Northern Sutras in general were the original one, it would be impossible to account for occasional mistranslations and for the fact that the most palpable dialect forms have been left untouched whenever the passage by being Sanskritized would have been spoiled. A striking instance is afforded in Alita Vistara, page 145. There we read that the pronouncing of the letter Tha of the Indian alphabet is to be brought in connection with the word Tha Pani Ya Prasna, i.e. a question that should be avoided set aside, Pali Tha Pani Ya Panyo. Here the context absolutely opposed itself to the Pali or Prakrit Tha Paniya being rendered by the Sanskrit Tha Paniya because the initial syllable of this form could not be made to agree with the letter Tha. On the same page of the La Lista Vistar, we also meet with the word Arapata, the initial syllable of which must needs harmonize with the diphthong AI, so that A Rapita Rapatha did not admit of being Sanskritized into Aryapatha. From the occurrence of this air Apatha, I infer that the original text was composed in some kind of Prakrit and not in regular Pali because the latter has lost both the primary and secondary diphthong AI. Though it may be asked whether forms such as Kai Ira, Sanskrit Karya, Pirupasati, Sanskrit Pirupasati, and the like are anything else but instances of inaccurate spelling. This much is certain that Thyria occurs in the inscriptions of Ashoka, and in these the diphthong cannot but have the value of a short, a followed by I. If we eliminate the Sanskrit, there remain two dialects, Pali and the Gatha idiom. Which of the two can lay claim to being the nearest original language of the Buddhist scriptures, or is the nearest approach to it? Pali is intelligible in its phonetics. The Gathas are not. Under ordinary circumstances, the comparatively greater regularity of Pali would tend to favor its claims. The case before us is, however, so peculiar that it is not safe to draw inferences from the state in which the Gathas have come to us. It seems to me that the verses in the northern books in general, as well as the prose of the Mahavastu, have been Sanskritized to a large extent so that they ought to be restored as much as possible to a more primitive form before a comparison with Pali can lead to satisfactory results. When we come across such words as Hashthad, Sanskrit Adasthad, Guna B, etc., we easily perceive that these forms are more primitive than Pali Hetha Gunahi, but what warrant have we of such forms being really in use at the time when the Gathas were composed if we observe that in a verse, Lalita Vistara 53, the syllable B is reckoned as a short one in the words Gunabi Pratipurna. In short, in their present state, the Gathas afford no conclusive evidence that the language in which they were composed is older than Pali. Whatever may have been the phonetic aspect of the oldest standard dialect of the Buddhists, its vocabulary is unmistakably closely related 
to that of the Sata Patha Brahmana. The coincidences are so striking that the interval separating the younger parts of the Satipatha and the beginnings of Buddhist literature can hardly be supposed to have been very great. Among those coincidences, I cite Sarvavat, a word which as yet has not been discovered in the whole range of Sanskrit literature except Satip 14.7.1.10. And in northern Buddhist writings, as well as in Pali, Sabhava. Ikoti Satap 12.224 recurs in Ikoti Bhava, Lalita Vistar, page 147, 8, 1, page 439.6, Pali Ikoti Bhava. The expression Samirita, in the sense of equipped, furnished with, occurs in Satapatha thrice, in Atharvaveda once in Sadharma Pundarika several times, e.g. in Pratagantasa Mirita chapter 22. We may add the Prakritism ing in Saming Ayati Brihad Anyaka 6, 4, 23 in the usual form in Buddhist works in Sanskrit, Gatha dialect, and Pali. Further, Manku Satap 5 or V 5411 Manda in the compound Now Manda Satap 2 3315 Bodhi Manda, an archaic trait in the stanzas, is the expletive use of the particle U, e.g., in Tenno, Yeno, Tazio, Adio. For tena yena tasya adya. Both in prose and poetry, we meet with no sometimes in the sense of Sanskrit no, which etymologically, of course, is identical with it, at other times in that of Sanskrit na. An analogous case is Sanskrit atho, almost imperceptibly differing. From Atha, perhaps the most curious of similar forms in the Gathas is Ko, in meaning exactly coinciding with Ka. This Ko I take to be the older form of the Magati Ku in the Ashoka Edicts. From the occurrence of peculiar old words and forms, we may draw inferences as to the age of certain compositions in ordinary cases, but it is not safe to apply the same tests. If there is sufficient reason to suppose that the work, the date of which we wish to determine, has been carefully molded upon time-honored models. In such a case, new words prove a good deal, old ones next to nothing. Therefore, it would be an abuse of the argument ex silentio to infer. From the total absence of such new words in our Sedarma Hunarika, that the bulk of the sutra must date from the earlier period of Buddhism, I had already occasion to notice that the two versions, the prose and the metrical one in our sutra, show here and there material discrepancies. The question arises, to which of the two we must award the palm of priority? Repeatedly, both in prose and poetry, the sutra is spoken of as consisting of stanzas, e.g. chapters 7, Sutra 82, chapters 10 and 22, in the prose portion several times. As the term of stanza, gatha, for aught I know, is never used to denote a certain number of syllables, there is a strong presumption that the ancient text consist, consisted of verses with an admixture of short prose passages serving as introduction or to connect the more solemn poetical pieces. The idea to expand such passages into a regular prose version would especially recommend itself at a period when the poetical dialect began to become obsolete and obscure. Without being a formal commentary, the prose version would yet tend to elucidate the older holy text. It will not be objected that because not all chapters in the Siddharma Pundarika have a poetical version added, the original cannot have been a poem. 
for the chapters containing but one version. 21, 22, 23, 25, and 26 show decided traces of being later editions, and as to the final chapter, it may be held to be a moderate amplification of a short prose epilogue. In contending that the original text of our sutra was probably, in the main, a work in metrical form, I do not mean to say that the poetical version in all the chapters must be considered to be prior to the prose. The Gathas of the Siddharma Pundarika are nowhere very brilliant, but in some chapters they are so excessively clumsy and mechanically put together that involuntarily we are led to the assumption of their having been made by persons to whom the old dialect was no longer familiar. The stanzas in chapters 11 and 14 are abominable in form and unusually silly. Those in chapter 24 are a pattern of mechanical verse making and give the impression as if they were intended rather to stultify than to edify the credulous reader. Now it is a curious fact that in a Chinese preface to the translation of our sutra by Ganga Gupta and Dharma Gupta, AD 601, we meet with the following notice. The omission of the Gathas in number 134, chapters 12 and 25 have since been filled in by some wise men whose example I wish to follow. Here we have a direct proof that the Gathas of some chapters have been added in later times. Had we similar notices concerning all the chapters in which the Gathas are of a comparatively modern date? And could we prove that the prose of such chapters belongs to a later period? Then the supposition of the ancient text of the Siddharma Pundarika, having been in the main a metrical one, would seem to lose in strength. For reasoning by analogy, one might say that just as some later chapters have notoriously been enriched with a metrical version in later times, so the ancient parts also will have gradually received their gathas. Still, the fact remains that those chapters in which the metrical portion is wanting clearly belong to a later period so that it is questionable whether their case is entirely analogous to that of the more ancient part of the whole work. At present, we are far from the ultimate end which critical research has to reach. We are not able to assign to each part of our sutra its proper place in the development of Buddhist literature. We may feel that compositions from different times have been collected into a not very harmonious whole, we may even be able to prove that some passages are as decidedly ancient as others are modern. But any attempt to analyze the compound and lay bare its component parts would seem to be premature. Under these circumstances, the inquiry after the date of the work resolves itself into the question at what time the book received its present shape. There exist... As it is well known, various Chinese translations of the Siddharma Pundarika, or parts of it, the dates of which are well ascertained. The above-mentioned catalog by Mr. Bunyu Nanjio affords some valuable information about the subject, from which I borrow the following particulars. The oldest Chinese translation, known by the title of Kan Fa Hua Qin, is from Ku Fa Hu Dharma Raksha of the Western Sin Dynasty AD 265 to 316 in 28 chapters equally old is an incomplete translation entitled Sa Than Fan Tho Li Kin of an unknown author. Next in time comes the Mia Fa Lian Hua Kin by Kuma Ragiva of the latter Sin dynasty AD 384 to 417. It agrees with the Tibetan version and contains 28 chapters of one chapter 24 in the Nepalese manuscripts in the English translation. Kuma Ragiva translated the prose only. The Gathas were rendered by Gnana Gupta of the Northern Q Dynasty, A.D. 557 to 589. 
the last translation in order of time, entitled Tian Fin Miao Fa Lian Hua Kin, is from Ganan Gupta and Dharmagupta, AD 601 of the Sui dynasty, in 27 chapters. We see that the older translations and consequently their originals counted one chapter more than our manuscripts. The difference, however, does not affect the contents of the whole because the matter divided over chapters 11 and 12 of the older translations is contained in chapter 11 of our texts in the latest Chinese version. The order of the chapters is the same in all the texts, both original and translated, up to chapter 20, 21 in the older division. The discrepancies first begin at chapter 21 on Dharanis. The subjoined comparative table to begin with the chapter on Dharanis exhibits the order of the last seven chapters in the various texts. The first column refers to the Nepalese manuscripts and the Chinese translation by Gnana Gupta and Dharma Gupta. The second to the oldest Chinese translation, the third to that of Kuma Ragiva. The table shows some numbers. 1, a glance at this table will suffice to convince us that chapters 21 through 26 1 through 6 are of later growth if we bear in mind that the order of the chapters down to the Dharanis is the same in all sources. This result is quite in harmony with what we would have guessed upon internal grounds. The last chapter, entitled Dharma Par Yaya, must from its very nature have been the close, the epilogue of the whole. In the Chinese translation of Kuma Ragiva, it occurs as the table shows immediately after chapter 20, by itself a clear indication that 21 through 26 are later editions. It is somewhat strange that in the older translation of Ku Fa Hu in the Dharma Pariyaya has already taken its place after the additional matter, but this may be explained on the supposition that Kuma Ragiva, though living in a later time, made use of ancient manuscripts. However that may be, I think that the following facts may be held to be established both from internal and external evidence. 1. The more ancient texts of the Siddharma Pundarika contain 21 chapters in an epilogue, i.e. the matter of chapters 1 through 20 and of chapter 27. Two, the later editions, excepting probably some verses, had been connected with the work in the way of Parishistas or Adenda, about 250 AD or earlier, as the book, along with the Parishistas, already existed some time before 250 AD. We may safely conclude that the more ancient text in 21 chapters, the epilogue included, dates some centuries earlier. Greater precision is for the present impossible. We know that a commentary on the Siddharma Pundarika was composed by Vazu Bandhu. The date of that work, not yet recovered it seems, must fall between 550 and 600 AD, or at least not much earlier, for Vasu Bandhu's pupil, Guna Prabha, became the guru of the famous Sri Harsha, alias Sila Ditya, king of Kanaj, the friend of Hyoen Tislang. The latter often mentions Vasubandhu and some of that great doctor's writings as well as Guna Prabha, as both worthies at the time of Huen Shithang's visiting India had already departed this life and Vasubandhu must have been at least one generation older than Guna Prabha. We cannot be far amiss in assigning to Vasubandhu's commentary the date above mentioned. It appears, or specified, it appears from the above-mentioned preface to the Chinese translation of AD 601 that the text differences in the manuscripts current in those days were more important than such as we observe in the Nepalese manuscripts from 1000 AD downward, with which the Tibetan closely agree. The Chinese preface is so interesting that it is worthwhile to copy a passage from it as quoted in the catalog of the Tripitaka. 
The translations of Ku Fahu, number 138, and Kumara Giva, number 34, are most probably made from two different texts. In the repository of the canon, I, the author of the preface, have seen two texts or copies of the text of the Siddharma Pundarika. One is written on the palm leaves and the other in the letters of Kwaits or Karakar, Kumargariva's maternal country. The former text exactly agrees with number 138 and the latter with number 134. Number 138 omits only the gathas of the Sam Anta Mukha Parivarta, chapter 24, but number 134 omits half of the Osha Parivarta, chapter 5, in the beginning of the Panka Bhikshu Sata Via Karana Parivarta, chapter 8, and that of the Sadharma Banaka. Parivarta chapter 10 and the Gathas of the Devadatta Parivarta chapter 12 and those of the Samanta Mukha Parivarta chapter 25. Moreover, number 134 puts the Dharma Pariyaya Parivarta, the last chapter of the Sutra, before the Baishagi Araga Parivarta chapter 23. Numbers 138 and 134 both place the Dharani Parivarta next to the Samantamukha Parivarta chapters 24 and 25, respectively. Beside these, there are minor differences between the text and translation. The omission of the Gathas in number 134, chapters 12 and 25, have since been filled in by some wise men whose example I wish to follow. In the first year of the Zanshu period, AD 601, I, together with Gnana Gupta and Dharma Gupta, have examined the palm leaf text at the request of a Sramana, Shanheen, and found that the beginning of two chapters, 8th and 10th, are also wanting in the text, though number 138 contains them. Nevertheless, we have increased a half of the 5th chapter and put the 12th chapter into the 11th and restored the Dharani Parivarta and Dharma Pariyaya Parivarta to their proper order as chapters 21 and 27. There are also some words and passages which have been altered while the greater part of number 134 is retained. The reader is re requested not to have any suspicion about these differences. According to the opinion of an eminent Chinese scholar, the late Stanislas Julien, the translation of Kuma Ragiva Wiley differs from Bernouf's. He gives utterance to that opinion in a letter dated June 12, 1866, and addressed to Professor Max Mueller, to whose obliging kindness it is due that I am able to publish a specimen of Kuma Ragiva's version rendered into French by Stanislas Julien. The fragment answers to the stanzas 1 through 22 of chapter 3. As it is too long to be inserted here, I give it hereafter on page 40. On comparing the fragment with the corresponding passages in Bernouf's French translation and the English version in this volume, the reader cannot fail to perceive that the discrepancies between the two European versions are fewer and of less consequence than between each of them and Kumaragiva's work. It is hardly to be supposed that the texts used by Kumaragiva can have differed so much from ours, and it seems far more probable that he has taken the liberty, for clearness sake, to modify the construction of the verses, a literal rendering thereof. It must be owned, it is impossible in any language. It is a pity that Stanislaus Julian has chosen for his specimen a fragment exclusively consisting of Gothas. A page in prose would have been far more useful as a test of the accuracy of the Chinese version. Proceeding to treat of the contents of our sutra, I begin by quoting the passage where Bernouf, in his usual masterly way, describes the general character of the book and the prominent features of the central figure in it. The illustrious French scholar writes, To this I have nothing to object, only something to add. It is perfectly true that Shakya does not receive the simple title of Deva. Why? Because that title is far too poor for so exalted a personage who is the Deva T. Deva, the paramount god of gods. So he is called in the Lotus, chapter 7, stanza 31 and innumerable times in the whole range of buddhist literature both in pali and sanskrit it is further undeniable that the title of adi buddha does not occur in the lotus 
but it is intimated that Sakya is identical with Adi Buddha in the words. From the very beginning, Adita Eva, I have roused, brought to maturity, fully developed them, the innumerable bodhisattvas, to be fit for their bodhisattva position. It is only by accommodation that he is called Adi Buddha, he properly being Anadi, i.e. existing from eternity, having no beginning. The Buddha most solemnly declares, chapter 15, that he reached Bodhi an immense time ago, not as people fancy, first at Gaya. From the whole manner in which Sakya speaks of his existence in former times, it is perfectly clear that the author wished to convey the meaning that the Lord had existed from eternity, or what comes to the same, from the very beginning, from time immemorial, etc. Shakya has not only lived an infinite number of aeons in the past, he is to live forever. Common people fancy that he enters nirvana, but in reality he only makes a show of nirvana out of regard for the weakness of men. He, the father of the world, the self-born one, the chief and savior of creatures, produces a semblance of nirvana whenever he sees them given to error and folly. In reality, his being is not subject to complete nirvana. It is only by a skillful device that he makes a show of it, and repeatedly he appears in the world of the living, though his real abode is on the summit of the grid Rakuta. All this is, in other words, the teaching of Narayana in Bhagavad Gita 4, 6. Ago Pisan Aviyatama Bhutanam Isvaro Pisan Prakritim Svam Adisthata Sambhavyama Radhamayaya Yada Yada He Dharmasya Glanir Bhavati Bharata Abhyuthanam Adharmasya Tada Manam Srigami Aham Parit Ranyaya Sadhunam Vinasya ka dush kitam dharma samasa panasaya sambhavama yuge yuge. The Buddha is anthropomorphic, of course, what God is not. The lotus, far from giving prominence to the unavoidable human traits, endeavors as much as possible to represent the Lord and his audience as superhuman beings. In chapter 14, there is a great pause as in a drama of no less than 50 intermediate kalpas, during which Shakyamuni and all his hearers keep silence. A second pause of 1,000, or according to a various reading, 100,000 years, is held in chapter 20. Now, it is difficult to conceive that any author willfully and ostentatiously would mention such traits if he wished, to impress the reader with the notion that the narrative refers to human beings. It will not be necessary to multiply examples. There is, to my comprehension, not the slightest doubt that the Siddharma Pundarika intends to represent Shakya as the supreme being, as the God of gods, almighty and all wise. But what have we to understand by the words God and God of gods? That is the question. To find the answer, let us recall to memory the theosophic notions prevailing in ancient India at certain periods. In general, it may be said that the Upanishads recognize two supreme beings which in a mystical way are somehow identified. One is the great illuminator of the macrocosm, and is sometimes called the sun, at other times ether. The other, the enlightener of the microcosm, is mind or reason. As soon as the sun ceased to be considered an animate being or to be represented as such, he might continue for worship's sake, honoris causa, to be called the highest god, the really remaining deity, was reason, poetically termed the inward light. This idea is expressed by Nila Kanta in his commentary on Bhagavad Gita 5, 14, in the following terms. Prabhus Kidatma Surya Ivasmada Dinam Prakasaka, the Lord is the intelligent self that, like a sun, is the illuminator of ourselves and others. 
Now the same author in his notes on Bhagavad Gita 6.30 distinctly states that our inward consciousness, or as he puts it, the Pratyagatman, the individual self, otherwise called Giva, is Narayana, i.e. the Supreme Being, at 9.28. He paraphrases Narayana by Sarvasham, Pratyagatman, the individual consciousness of all sentient beings, at 12.14, he identifies Narayana with Nirgunam Brahma. Just as here and there, Narayana is represented as clad in all the glory and majesty of his sovereign, as the illuminator, the vivifier of the world, in one word, as the sun, so we find Shakyamuni invested with all the grandeur and all the resources of a ruler of nature. Philosophically, both Narayana and his counterpart, Shakyamuni, are Purushottama, para Matman, the highest Brahman mind with a capital M. Shakyamuni is esoterically the very same Muni, the beholder of good and evil, the Punya Papak Shita Muni that is spoken of in Manu 891. It is acknowledged in Bhagavad Gita 9 14 sec that the Supreme Being may be conceived and respected in different ways according to the degree of intelligence of creatures. Some pay their worship by leading a virtuous life, others by pious devotion, others by contemplation, others by confessing a strictly monistic philosophy, others by acknowledging a personal God. The Lord in the Siddharma Pundarika admits of being viewed in all these various aspects, whether the Buddha theory, such as we find it developed in the Sutra, not in plain words, indeed, but by circumlocutions and ambiguities, should be called atheistic or not is a matter of comparatively slight importance, about which opinions may differ. This much, however, may be asserted that the Lotus and the Bhagavad Gita are, in this respect, exactly on a par. The conclusion arrived at is that the Sakyamuni of the Lotus is an ideal, a personification, and not a person. Traits borrowed or rather surviving from an older cosmological mythology and traces of ancient nature worship abound both in the Lotus and the Bhagavad Gita but in the highest sense of the word Paramarthatas the Purushatama in both is the center of mental life it is just possible that the ancient doctors of the Mahayana have believed that such an ideal once walked in the flesh here on earth but the impression left by the spirit in the letter of the whole work, does not favor that supposition. In later times, fervent adherents of the Mahayana really held that belief, as we know from the example of the pious Hyoen Thang, who was evidently as earnest in his belief that the Lord once trod the soil of India as he was convinced of Manguzri, Maitreya, and Avalokitesvara existing as animated beings. Whether the system of the lotus can be said to agree with what is supposed to be genuine Buddhism, it is not here the place to discuss. So far as the northern church is concerned, the book must be acknowledged as the very cream of orthodoxy. It is the last, the supreme, the most sublime of the sutras exposed by the Lord. It is, so to say, the Siromani, the crown jewel of all sutras. The contents of the separate chapters into which the sutra is divided may be described summarily as follows. 1. Prologue. 2. Awakening of the Lord from his mystic trance. Display of his transcendent skillfulness proved by the apparent trinity of vehicles, whereas in reality there is but one vehicle. 3. Prophecy of the Lord regarding the future destiny of Sariputra, his eldest son second turn of the wheel of the law on that occasion with the incidental commemoration of the first turn near Benares parable of the burning house to exemplify the skill of the good father in saving his children from the burning pains of mundane existence another parable exemplifying the skill of the wise father in leading a child that has gone astray and lost all self-respect back to a feeling of his innate nobility and to happiness parable of the plants in the rain to exemplify the impartiality and equal care of the Lord for all creatures. Parable 
of the blind man to intimate that the phenomena have but an apparent reality and that the ultimate goal of all endeavors must be to reach all knowingness which in fact is identical with complete nescience six sundry predictions as proofs of the power of the sagata to look into the future seven he has an equal knowledge of the remotest past his remembrance of the turning of the wheel by the tathagata maha bignana na bibu edifying history of the 16 sons of the said tathagata eight prophecy regarding 500 arhats nine prophecy concerning ananda rahula and the 2000 monks 10 the lord teaches how pious preachers of the law who will come in after times ought to be duly honored and promises that he will always protect the ministers of religion 11 display of the miraculous power of sakyamuni shown in the appearance of a stupa which being opened by him discloses to sight the frame of the expired tathagata prabhu tarana who is desirous of hearing the exposition of the lotus of the true law how shakyamuni in a former birth strove to acquire the lotus his great obligations to devadatta episode of the wise daughter of the ocean and her change of sex 12. prediction to gautami yasodhara and the nuns in their train promise of the host of disciples and bodhisattvas to take up the difficult task of preaching the holy word in days to come after the lord's nirvana 13 vocation of the ministers of religion and practical rules for their conduct in and out of society parable of the king who rewards his valiant warriors in the same manner the buddha will reward those who struggle for his sake by bestowing upon them all kinds of favors at last the most valuable of his boons eternal rest 14 splendid phantasmagory of innumerable bodhisattvas evoked by the creative power of the lord long pause during which the tathagata and the four classes of hearers are silent perplexity of maitreya on hearing that the innumerable bodhisattvas have all been the pupils of the lord 15 the buddha explains the fact by revealing the immense duration of his lifetime in the past and the future 16 meritoriousness of the belief in the immense duration of the tathagatas and all those who have once become buddhas 17 the lord details the great merit attending a ready acceptance of the preaching of the law 18 exposition of the advantages worldly and spiritual enjoyed by the ministers of religion 19 story of sada parabuta exemplifying the superiority of simple-mindedness and pure-heartedness to worldly wisdom and skepticism 20 grand show exhibited by the two tathagata sakyamuni and praputarata conjointly pause after the performance after the pause a great stir amongst gods celestial and infernal beings men etc the tathagata extols the sutra of the lotus in which all buddha laws are succinctly taught as well as the keepers of this most eminent of sutras immediately after this chapter may have followed in the oldest version the epilogue entitled period of the law the reasons for this opinion have been already stated above the supposed additional chapters contain the following topics briefly indicated 21 efficacy of talismanic spells dharanis 22 self-sacrifice of the bodhisattva sarvasatva priyadarasana otherwise called by sha gyaraga glorification of the lotus as the most eminent of sutras 23 visit of the bodhisattva god god asvara to the saha world extraordinary qualities and achievements of this worthy incidentally narrated by the tathagata return of the bodhisattva to whence he came 24 grandeur and ubiquitousness of avalokitesvara 25 wonderful and edifying story of the conversion of the king subhaviyuha through the instrumentality of his two sons vimalagarbha and vimalanetra al by shagayaraga and by sha gyasamudgata 26 the bodhisattva samanta bhadra 
charges himself with the task of being a protector to the preachers of religion in after times after the Lord's nirvana. This summary, however meager, will be sufficient to show that there is no lack of variety in our sutra. We may indeed be satisfied that the compilers have intended giving an exposition of the principal truths of their religion in general and of the peculiar tenets of their own system in particular, the whole with anxious care arranged in such a form that the sutra admitted of an exoterical and esoterical interpretation. It contains a revelation of the state of things in the present as well as in the past and the future, a revelation derived from a virtually eternal source so that the doctrine taught in it must be deemed valid not only for a certain spiritual brotherhood or church, but for the human race at large. The highest authority to whom the doctrine is referred is not a certain individual having lived a short span of time somewhere in India, but the sublime being who has his constant abode on the grid Harakuta, i.e., he who is the terminology of other Indian creeds is called Kutastha. As a general rule, it may be said that in such works of ancient Indian literature as are anonymous, we must distinguish between the authority and the author. In the Lotus, we meet after the invocation in some manuscripts the following distich. Vipul ya sutra ragan param ar thanaya va taranir desam sadharm a pundarikam sadvaya mahapatham va shayi. I, I shall proclaim the king of the Vipulya Sutras that teacheth how one arrives at the right method of attaining the highest truth. That Siddharma Pundarika, the great road leading to substantiality, being in abstracto. The person here speaking is not the Buddha, who is neither the author nor the writer of the work. Have we then to ascribe the distich to one of the ancient copyists? Bernouf decidedly thinks so and his opinion is corroborated by the fact that the verses do not occur in all manuscripts. I must confess that I am not so sure of it, as the sutra, like other compositions of the kind, begins with a solemn, Thus have I heard, etc. It is at least possible that the distich belongs to the compiler. I am not aware that the scribes were in the habit of using such expressions as vak, or synonymous terms instead of leek. To write, and as we find in the Mahavastu similar features as Vakshi, Yud Irayashiyam, and Umpavar Nai Ish Yami, where they can hardly be imputed to the scribe, it is safer to leave the question whether the opening distich of the lotus is the work of a compiler or of a copyist undecided. The more so because the parallel phrase, Athato, Vyakya Sayama, frequently found immediately after the invocation in non-Buddhistic writings, must be held to refer to the author or author's compilers. The Lotus being one of the standard works of the Mahayana, the study of it cannot but be useful for the right appreciation of that remarkable system. A perusal of the book will convince the reader that a statement of Professor Wasseljus can only be accepted with some restrictions when this scholar so profoundly versed in the history and development of northern buddhism says that the buddha of the mahayana is neither the creator nor the ruler of the world he remains the same cold and different egoist absorbed in nothingness the tathagata of the lotus is passionless indeed but that does not involve his being an egoist in general it may be said that the spirit of the Mahayana is more universal, its ideal less monastical than the Hinayanas. According to Professor Rise Davids, we must not seek the superior vital power, which enabled the great vehicle to outlive the earlier teaching in certain metaphysical subtleties. But in the idea of a desire to save all living creatures, the idea to quote his own words as summarized in the theory of Bodhisattva, is the keynote of the later school just as our hotship is the keynote of early Buddhism. The Mahayana doctor said in effect, we grant you all you say about the bliss of attaining nirvana in this life, but it produces advantage only to yourselves, and according to your own theory, there will 
be a necessity for Buddhas in the future as much as there has been for Buddhas in the past. Greater, better, nobler than than the attainment of our hot ship must be the attainment of bodhisattva from a desire to save all living creatures in the ages that will come. The teaching of the lotus, however, is different and comes to this that everyone should try to become a Buddha. It admits that from a practical point of view, one may distinguish three means, so-called vehicles, yanas, to attain the summum bonum nirvana, although in a higher sense there is only one vehicle. These means are, in plain language, piety, philosophy, or rather yogism, in striving for the enlightenment and well of our fellow creatures. These means are designated by the terms of vehicle of obedient hearers or disciples, of pratyaka buddhas, and of bodhisattvas. Higher than piety is true and self-acquired knowledge of the eternal laws. Higher than knowledge is devoting oneself to the spiritual well of others. The higher unity embracing the three separate vehicles is the Buddha vehicle. The title of Bodhisattva is not always used in the same acceptation. Apart from broad distinction, we can draw between human and superhuman Bodhisattvas. The latter are here left out of account. We find sometimes the word applied to those persons who, in the passage of our sutra alluded to, are styled Shravakas, hearers, learners. This appears to be the case, at least in Nepal, as we know from the following passage. <clears throat> the Buddha is the adept in the wisdom of Buddhism, Bodhijananya, whose first duty, so long as he remains on earth, is to, meet, is to communicate his wisdom to those who are willing to receive it. These willing learners are the bodhisattvas, so-called from their hearts being inclined to the wisdom of Buddhism, and sanghas, from their companionship with one another and with their Buddha or teacher in the viharas, or konobitical establishments. The bodhisattva or sangha continues to be such until he has surmounted the very last grade of that vast and laborious ascent by which he is instructed that he can scale the heavens and pluck immortal wisdom from its resplendent source, which achievement performed, he becomes a Buddha that is an omniscient being. Here the bodhisattvas are plainly distinguished from the Soenobitical monks. They are so likewise in the lotus, in which we find them also in the function of learned or wise men, panditas, of preachers or ministers of religion. Also, Ju 1c remarks about the Bodhisattva, the terrestrial one, of course, that from one side he seems to be the substitute of the ancient bhikshu, from which we ought not to infer that the mendicant monks as such cease to exist, for that is notoriously not the case, but that the Bodhisattvas were charged with the office of preaching. They are persons who deserve to be honored both by mendicant monks and lay devotees, and formed, it would seem, a kind of learned clergy, not to be confounded, however, with the modern Vagra Akaryas, or married clergymen in Nepal. There is reason to suppose that one of the honorific titles given to the preachers or interpreters of the law was wise or learned man. Pandita, for the word is so often applied to them that it looks more like a title than a common epithet. Taranatha knows Pandita to be a title and considers it to be the equivalent of the older Mahabandata. He distinguishes Bodhisattvas from common Panditas and Arhats. How does this agree with the data in the Lotus? As it has been intimated in a foregoing note, the three vehicles are imitations of three asramas or stages in the model life of an Arya in the first place of a Brahmin. The stages are that of a student, of a hermit living in the forest, and of a sannyasin, yati or mukta, 
who has wholly given up the world. The second stage, that of a householder, does not exist, of course, for those who vow themselves to a monastic life. Our sutra does not prescribe that the three stages must be gone through by the same persons no more than the Bhagavad Gita 1c requires that one should pass the stages of study, knowledge, and meditation before resolving upon complete renunciation, tiyaga. What follows from the context is only this, that the vehicle of bodhisattvas, alias those who strive for the well of all creatures, is superior to the two preceding vehicles. The vehicle of the bodhisattvas being the loftiest of the three, they themselves must be considered as occupying the highest rank. Now, Taranatha places the Arhats above them, and with the Nepalese also the first class of the monastic order is that of Arhat. The question is, how are we to judge of the relation between Arhats and Bodhisattvas in the Lotus? As far as I am able to see, the compiler of the sutra describes facts or supposed facts, which he knew from oral or literary tradition, as having occurred in the past, whereas the actual state of things in his own time and shortly before is represented as that of the future. His arhats are sages of the past, canonized saints, his human bodhisattvas are sages, wise men of the present, most reverent worthies, who should live a saintly life and generally do so, but who, however sanctimonious, are not acknowledged saints. Of an antagonism between arhats and bodhisattvas, there is no trace in the book. The arhats being dead, they cannot be active. The bodhisattvas as living persons can, in a certain respect, then, the remark of Professor Rise Davids holds good. The bodhisattvas represent the ideal of spiritual activity, the arhats of inactivity. It must be admitted that the lotus as a whole breathes a less monastic and ascetic spirit. It does not go the length to speak of asceticism and mortification in such scornful terms as the Bhagavad Gita does, but at the same time it never extols it. There are in the book many indications that the art of preaching was made much of and highly developed, and it may be supposed that a greater proficiency in hermeneutics combined with superior mental activity has enabled the Mahayana to supplant its rival, the Hinayana, and to extend its spiritual conquests once, from the snows of Siberia to the luxuriant islands of the Indian archipelago. After having touched upon such points in the text of the Siddharma Pundarika as seemed to require more special notice, it behooves me to say a few words about the translation and its resources. In the first place, I must declare that I cannot speak in too warm terms of the benefit I have derived from the French translation by the illustrious Bernouf. I have taken that work throughout for my model without having been able to reach its excellency. The material discrepancies between his translation are partly due to my having followed other manuscripts, partly to another interpretation, especially of frequently corrupt and difficult Gathas. If some reader not acquainted with the peculiar difficulties of those Gathas should wonder at the occurrence of numerous discrepancies, I would repeat the words of the preface to the Chinese version from AD 601 and request him not to have any suspicion about these differences. Let him compare the fragment from Kumaragiva's rendering on page 40 with the corresponding passages in the French and English translations, and he will observe that the difference between the work of the learned Buddhists of the 4th century and the two European versions is far more considerable than between the latter. The base of my translation has been an old manuscript on palm leaves belonging to Dr. D. Wright's collection in the University Library of Cambridge. The manuscript is dated New R. Era 159 equals A.D. 1039 and was written in the reign of the King Kamadeva in the bright half of the month by Shaka on a Thursday. It is one of the most ancient Sanskrit manuscripts existing in Europe. 
and therefore I thought that it was advisable to follow its readings as much as possible, except in such passages as were evidently corrupt. A second manuscript, unfortunately incomplete from the same collection, is of unknown date since the latter part of the codex is lost. From the form of the characters it may be inferred that it is not much more modern than the other codex. The difference between both is not very great, yet there can be no doubt that the second manuscript belongs to another family. The Varietas Lectianis is strikingly similar in kind to what we find in the different texts of the Vagra Kadika, edited by Professor Max Mueller. The former manuscript has much in common with the London codices, from which Bernouf, in the notes on his translation, has derived numerous various readings It stands farther off from the Paris manuscript that has formed the base of Bernouf's version, but not so far as the second Cambridge manuscript, which shows the greatest number of peculiar readings. The text of chapter 4 in Professor Foucault's edition of the parable de l'Enfant Igoire is comparatively modern and bad. In general, it may be said that all the known copies of the Siddharma Pundarika are written with a want of care, little in harmony with the holy character of the book. Before closing this preface, I beg to offer my sincere thanks to Professors William Wright and E.B. Cowell at Cambridge for the generous way in which they have enabled me to use the manuscripts I wanted for my translation. My thanks are due also to the Council of Cambridge University and Mr. H. Bradshaw for their readily complying with my wishes. To Professor Max Mueller, I owe a debt of gratitude for his kindly assisting me in my task in more than one respect a debt which I am glad here openly to acknowledge. H. Kern, Leiden.